clearly I'm not Daniel. So let's see. There you go. Whew. I can't believe I'm standing here after following all these amazing speakers, right? So um, thank you for being here today. I am from Winston-Salem, so it's always great to be back. My hometown, I lived the first 50 years of my life here. Yes, I am that old. I want to take you on a journey. I'm a storyteller. But before I start telling you my story, I want you to think about the person in this world you love the most. Is it your child? Is it your spouse, your partner? Maybe it's your mother, your father. It could be your brother or your sister. Maybe it's just your best friend. Maybe you're sitting beside them right now. And I want you to make them the central character in the next few minutes in my story. So I want to tell you a little bit about Jackie. Jackie was a young woman of color. She was a mother of two young little girls. She worked, and she was in love with her partner. One day she comes home. It's a Friday. Her two daughters are going off for the weekend with Grandma to have a special treat. Jackie waves goodbye. The children see their mother standing in her uniform, and they wave goodbye because they're going to see her tomorrow. Little did they know that Jackie that day would be kidnapped. She would be tortured. She would be raped. And before she died, a stick would be shoved down her throat to crush her voice box so she could not scream out. Her partially nude body would be found in a soybean field not far away. Or maybe the story is Linda. She's an eight-year-old little girl who's sleeping one night in her home, and a man breaks in, and he rapes her, and he sodomizes her, and he destroys her childhood forever. Nothing will ever be the same. Dr. Banks, he's a history professor. He goes down to New Orleans for a conference. He's a teacher. Goes out to dinner with his colleagues one night. And on the way back from dinner outside of the hotel, he's robbed and he's shot in the face and he lays dying and bleeding to death in front of the hotel. It could be Tamisha. Tamisha's 12. A man breaks into her apartment through her window and tells her, do not scream or I will kill your mother. And so she endures it in silence. And when the attack is over, she creeps next door and looks at her mother and says, Mom, I think I've just been raped. Maybe it's Nathan. Nathan's 20, and he loves his sister, and he's washing the car because he's going to teach her how to drive that day. But a couple of young men come by and decide they want that car. They steal that car. They execute Nathan a single bullet to his head. He dies, and the car is found a few hours later burned after they take a joyride. Why am I telling you these stories? Why is it important that I tell you these stories? Because these stories are also my story. See, in all of these cases and all these stories I'm telling you about, they were all overturned years, decades later. The person that they thought had killed their loved one, the person that they thought had raped their bodies and tried to murder them, was innocent. And this day of incredible jubilation for a wrongfully convicted man or woman is just another layer of another nightmare for these family members. What is justice anyway, right? The criminal justice system is predicated and tasked with providing justice and closure for crime victims and survivors. They tell you that. But what is justice in a wrongful conviction for a crime victim or a survivor? It is an illusion. It is elusive. It is ripped from them. There is no closure. It's a gaping, open, 
hemorrhaging wound that will never close. In 1984, I was 22 years old. I was at Elon College. I was doing everything right. I worked. I was dating a respectable guy. I was paying my bills. I was making a 4.0 GPA. And all of it ended at 3 a.m. on July 29th of 1984 when I was awakened by a stranger who was on my body with a knife to the left side of my throat and looked at me and said, shut up or I will kill you. And in those moments, as you reconcile this idea that I may die tonight, what you think about is, how will I die tonight? How fast will I die? Or how slow will I die? And over the 20 minutes as my body and my spirit were being raped, I made a plan. Two plans. One was to remember everything about this person, and the second plan was to survive. I lived. I was lucky, as I like to tell you. I survived that night. I was able to escape. I ended up at a home that I didn't know who lived there, but it happened to be a professor from Elon College, and they saved me. Within moments after being raped, I was taken to the hospital for the rape kit to be done. Because see, my body had become the crime scene. The evidence of the crime was on my body and in my body, and it had to be collected, and it had to be put in little Ziploc bags and labeled later for evidence. Vaginal swab, pubic hair, nail clippings, it all had to be collected. And it was there that I learned that this man who had just destroyed everything had gone on to rape a second woman within an hour after raping me. I could hear her down the hall crying. I was then taken to the police station. Again, under tremendous trauma, other evidence had to be collected, and that was my memory. What do I remember? What did he look like? What was he wearing? What did his voice sound like? What, how tall was he? How much did he weigh? But I had studied these things, and I knew the right answer to this, and I gave them the information, and within three days after my rape, I was called down to do a photographic lineup. I knew they had a suspect. Why would I be here? I saw, I saw him. It was number three. Photograph number three. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Good job. They said that's who we thought it was. And the relief was overwhelming because we had a serial rapist running through the streets of Burlington, North Carolina, and I knew he was going to hurt somebody else. This was a matter of public safety. And I had been a good rape survivor. See, I wasn't drinking that night, right? I wasn't wearing provocative clothing. My doors were locked, my blinds were shut. I was a good rape victim. 10 days later, I was called back down to do a physical lineup. And we see these things in cop shows and detective shows, right? You go into the police station, you're looking through that window. Not so much. The police department was being renovated. So I was taken to an abandoned schoolhouse to the second floor where the only thing between me and the suspect was a folding table. But again, I got it right. It was number five. And again, I was told, good job. The next part of this journey was a trial. Two weeks I sat in that courtroom. Day after day, two and a half days, I had to recount every disgusting detail of what he had done to my body, to strangers. Fortunately, the system got it right, right? I mean, he was guilty. He was going to be sentenced to life in 50 years. And now, as they say, you get to put it behind you, Jennifer. You get to move on, move forward, recover. The problem with that is there was no moving on because I had nothing to move on to. Everything I had planned on was over. My boyfriend, see, he couldn't really handle me because I needed a lot of support. My friends didn't really want to hang out with me because I cried a lot. 
And family didn't want to talk to me about what happened to me because rape is really uncomfortable. And so I did what most crime victims and survivors do after unbelievable violence and trauma, is I tried to ingest as much alcohol and cocaine up my nose as I possibly could because if I could numb my skin, if I didn't have to feel it, then I might could get through the day. And it worked for a while until I almost died. What they tell you when you're a crime victim or a survivor is that it's over now. What they don't tell you is there's nothing over about it. I didn't know about appeals. I didn't know about motions for appropriate relief. I didn't know any of this. So in 1987, the state of North Carolina reversed the decision, called for a new trial. Again, I was really lucky because in the second trial, he would be found guilty again except this time he would get two life sentences in 30 years. And once again, right, you're tasked with moving forward. But crime and violence is a lot like a tornado. It blows through your life, it shatters things, and you are left trying to pick up the pieces that you recognize, a teacup here, a photograph there, anything that resembles your former life. And the more tornadoes that go through your life, the less pieces there are to pick up because there's less that you remember, there's less that you recognize. And so I'm shattered over and over again. I got married in 1988. I got pregnant in 1989. And in 1990, a few miles away from here at Forsyth Hospital, I gave birth to triplets, two girls and a boy. They kept me alive. See, I couldn't die now. I had babies. I couldn't die. They gave me a reason to wake up every day. They gave me a task. They gave me a job. And I loved it until 1995. Eleven years later, a DNA test was run. And standing in my kitchen on Archer Road in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, they looked at me and they said, so that DNA, it's not Ronald's. It belongs to a man by the name of Bobby Poole. I fell into a black hole. I was paralyzed by fear. I was paralyzed by guilt for what had happened to Ronald Cotton. I had been on the unknown road, and here I am, and it is a dead end. Ronald is going to be released, and it's celebration for him and his family. Of course, as it should be, but for me, the world wanted a pound of flesh from Jennifer Thompson. The world wanted me to apologize for what had happened to Ronald Cotton. The world wanted to find me, they wanted to know me, and they wanted to blame me. And so I did what I thought was the right thing. I became really, really tiny. Because if you can't find me, you can't blame me. And I lived like that for two years. And I was suffocating. After two years of Ronald being home, I asked for a meeting with him. I wanted to sit in the same space with him. I wanted to ask him questions. He needed to ask me questions. And we sat in a church about a mile and a half away from where I had been raped those 13 years before. And we began to talk about what we had lost, what we longed for the trauma, the fear, what was the worst day of your life? Why did you think it was me? And it was in that space with each other that for the first time in 13 years, I started to heal those little broken pieces of my soul, started finding their way home again. The world found me that day. 
And for the next 15 years, I was asked to parade on stages back and forth all across the United States, throughout Canada and parts of Europe, to tell my story, to atone for what I had done, to apologize for something that was done to me. And I thought that's what I should do. And I did. I did. I apologized for years. In 2009, I was to go to Boston to do some training for the FBI on eyewitness identification and memory and trauma and how all of those kind of work together and how they fail. But before going to Boston, I got a death threat. A man who reached out to me and said, if I can find you, I will kidnap you. I'm going to rape you, and I'm going to slit your throat from ear to ear, and I will watch you bleed to death in a ditch because that's what you deserve. And I made a decision that day that this was, this was over, right? This was over. I'm not doing this anymore, but I had to go to Boston first. I went to Boston. I did what I needed to do, and I remember that evening being in a cocktail party, and I decided to position my body in the back of the room with my back against the wall looking at the entrance because maybe this guy lived in Boston. And about then, this really beautiful man walks through the door and he's headed straight to me and I'm like, oh God, this is the end. He's going to kill me. Instead, he walked up to me and he said, are you Jennifer Thompson? And I was very reluctant to say yes. He said, my name is Ben I've only been out of prison for six months. I got a job. I took the day off and got a bus ticket because I wanted to come down here and I wanted to see you and I wanted to tell you thank you. I knew your story. It was in my footlocker in prison. And I just hoped that one day I would be Ronald Cotton. And if I was, I wanted to thank you for the work you do. And it was at that moment that I realized who I get to give my power to. Where does my power go, and who gets it? And at the end of the day, it's not going to be the guy who's sitting in his mother's basement with 42 cats playing space invaders who threatens my life. It's going to be Ben. That was a pivotal, changing, shifting moment for me. And I began to kind of work my way back to the truth, to my truth, to my story, because my harm had gotten erased for all those years. It had put me in position to meet other exonerated men and women and hear their stories and their mother's stories and their children's story, but it also allowed me to hear the stories of the victims from these cases, the crime survivors, the murder victim family members. And what I realized in listening to their stories is how much we had in common, the shared experiences, the shared traumas. And if the criminal justice system was breaking us, where were we going to go to be repaired? And what did healing even look like in that space? So in 2015, I launched the first ever national nonprofit to address the total harm caused to everybody in a wrongful conviction case, to create equity in our narratives, to bring their voices to an even playing field where everybody gets heard. Not just the single narrative over here, not just the guy you see in the newspaper the day he's exonerated, but the stories of everybody and how they're harmed. And so I decided to start Healing Justice on the principle of restorative justice. Restorative justice asks three questions. How were you harmed? What do you need? And whose job is it to fix that? Well, in truth, the job to fix that is who broke you. The perpetrator. Wrongful convictions can't happen unless there's a bad person out there creating harm. But this guy's not going to be present. And more often than not, we'll never know who they are. So it's the system. The system's not going to step forward and claim responsibility. So how do we address this? At Healing Justice, every program we run, everything we do is led by, created by, and designed by directly impacted people, the exonerees, the families, the crime victims. 
using circle process, which is Native American in its nature, we sit together in circles. We run retreats that last four days and three nights, and we use all different types of techniques to address the harm that's been caused to us. We share our stories, not the stories you read in the newspaper, but the stories, the stories of our losses, the stories of our grief, the stories of our longing. We use expressive arts to visually show people what happened to us. We use improv games to teach the child to come back and laugh again, maybe for the first time in 30 years. We have letting go ceremonies, gratitude ceremonies, all in this idea of really addressing in truth what happened to us. Because what we have found at Healing Justice is when we create safe spaces, safe containers, people can show up. And when people can show up in their authentic selves and step into their truth and take off their armor and the mask they've been wearing, we create community. And when we create community, we create connections. And when we create connections, belonging occurs. And it's in the belonging that we begin to heal. So I'm going to ask you this as I walk off the stage. The next time you see one of these articles about a wrongful conviction in the newspaper or listen to it on the news, I want you to think about the other people that are impacted because I will tell you this. Bobby Poole, the man who tried to kill me that night, went on to commit 24 other violent crimes, six of which were first-degree rapes. So it's not just that single narrative, right? It's you. You are the community. You deserve public safety. So the next time you see these stories, I want you to understand that it's not just the small voice that you've heard in the newspaper. It's all of us. We are all directly impacted when the system fails. Thank you.